Our last speaker for this morning's session is Ian Johnson. Um, Ian has joined us from Caltech, um, where he and he's been working this summer with Erica, and he'll tell us about their project together, Light After Death, Lessons from the Kilanova Light Curve of HD 222925's Progenitor. All right. Thank you, Graham, for the introduction. Uh, I'll start now. Oh, uh, sure. Cool. All right. So over here, again, lessons from the Kilanova Light Curve of HD 22925's Progenitor. Um, but before we get too much into anything, uh, what is a kilonova? Hello. There we go. Uh, what are kilonova? And I got a nice little video for you as I kind of explain uh, what's going on in kilonova and hopefully you can understand why they're so important. Yes, thank God, play. Uh, so right here you see two neutron stars um, in their in spiral about to merge and they're radiating off, uh, radiating off gravitational waves. Those are those ripples. Then once they merge, they explode in a giant ball of heat, light, and super heavy uh, elements. Uh, in this process, we get 50% of the elements that we see naturally heavier than uh, iron. That is 50% of things, of all things heavier than iron are made in this process. That and um, the other 50% is uh, supernova. So kilonova are very important because they birth complexity in our natural planet, or our, not even our planet, but the entire universe. So that's a nice video, but uh, what does this process look like in real time, more broken down? So we start off with a neutron star merger, and this creates two things. One, as they in spiral and then merge and ring down, they make gravitational waves. Um, and then right after they merge, they make, for a very short period of time, a hypermassive neutron star. And this hypermassive neutron star then informs the initial conditions, which then define the kilonova explosion, which happens after. Uh, you can think of it since often hammer just happened, uh, that's like an atomic bomb going off. Uh, and then once this kilonova happens, we have, during the process, heavy element decay, which creates light. And then after oh, hours to weeks, um, we have these mostly stable isotopes. I say mostly because, again, everything that we see in the natural world uh, is made by this. So that includes uranium. So we can observe all these things, but we can sum. So we can observe gravitational waves, and we have with GW178.17. And then we can also observe the light, which we did in the corresponding case, which is the first case of multi-messenger astronomy. So huge, huge um, case in astrophysics uh, with AT2017 GFO. But then we can also observe these mostly stable isotopes. We live on these mostly stable isotopes. Uh, but we don't do too much kilonova um, theory based on these most stable isotopes. So that's what actually informs this project. Um, we've only observed one kilonova, um, maybe two as of very recently, but the population is very small. So it'd be nice to have more to understand the models, and understand just what's going on. And, and then number two is that the nuclear physics, which create these uh, heavy elements, is very mysterious. There's an example there. Um, and it's really important to understand how these kilonova decay, the synthesis that goes on in the initial conditions, because see this periodic table of elements, hopefully everybody's very familiar with that. This is the periodic table which is made by kilonova, which is, you might notice, a lot of it. Um, so we want to understand this number two so we can understand how we get this periodic table that exists in the natural world, which informs the project. Uh, number one, and the first thing, is to create the first light curve of a past kilonova via stellar abundances. And after we do that, we seek to reconcile some disagreements in the nuclear models which create um, our light curve and those observed abundances. But what do I mean by observed abundances? Oh, uh, it's more uh, formatting issues. Anyways, uh, this is astrophysical archaeology. So live kilonova are incredibly rare. Again, we've only seen one of them. Uh, confidently. So like archaeologists, we are going to study their remains. Certain stars like HD22925, um, it's very long name, essentially it's just a metal poor star that's really good at preserving the bones of mergers. Basically the elements that we expect to see after kilonova are well represented in certain stars like HD22925. In its spectra, which you see here, um, these little black lines are just um, certain elements absorbing certain bands of light, um, which we can then understand how much of each of these elements exist. And they're very thin, which is actually good um, because it is metal poor. 
So now, going from these abundances uh, back in time to understand the initial conditions, we can turn this process over time into this process, where we start with the mostly stable isotopes on the scale of giga years, which is today, um, going back up past uh, the heavy element decay, which again is over hours to weeks, um, to the initial conditions, which happen right before uh, the kill node happens. Yeah, and then basically we're using these mostly stable isotopes as an endpoint for simulations, trying to go down through here. But what do I mean by these initial conditions? Uh, you see in parentheses YE, and YE is gonna be very important for the rest of this talk. YE is the electron fraction um, defined here, it's not terribly complicated. It's essentially the number of protons divided by the number of neutrons plus number of protons. Um, we use it because it's the inverse and it's a good way to dictate neutron richness. If you're gonna think of neutron stars as two atoms smashing into each other, it's good to know what's smashing into <laughs> each other and what's left over. Um, but why is that so simple? It's not necessarily a single value, it's, it's mixed. Uh, at least if you're gonna pick a pretty rigorous model. Um, so we recreate the initial conditions by going through Monte Carlos to just test these initial distributions and try to recreate these stellar abundances with the Monte Carlo machine. Uh, Monte Carlo, part of chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and this is what my mentor did previous um, in order to get this initial YE distribution which is essentially the start of where my project is. Um, so with these initial conditions, we can create the other observable. Uh, notably, there are gravitational waves which would you know, occur up here, but I don't think we're getting those. Um, so the only other thing that we can do is get light uh, and create the second ever light curve of a kill nova. So how do we do that? How do you get the light curve from these initial conditions? Um, there's two key steps, and I'm vastly simplifying here. I love to answer some more questions on these models. Um, but basically, we combine the different heating rates from these different YE decay paths, which you see over here. These like single YE paths um, are based on if the entire kill nova started with a single neutron richness. Um, and we combine these early on in the simulation so that we have um, a mixed trajectory, which should better articulate the complexities of the kill nova model. And then we construct the light curve according to a toy model, which has a bunch of parameters and is effectively uh, a bunch of differential equations all acting at once in Metzger's 2017 paper, very aptly titled uh, Kill Nova. Um, and then that's how we get these uh, white curves over here. These are just different fits to different stellar abundances. Um, they don't matter too much in the scope of this project. And they might have, they end up not really making a huge difference. Um, and yeah, this is basically the answer to the, the first question that we had for this project. These are the, or more so all of them, are the kill nova light curve of HG22925's progenitor. So what was one is now two. Um, and now we have two kill nova light curves. And we can compare them with the past um, one event that we've seen. So using regressions from a different kill nova model which doesn't uh, run based on these initial YE conditions, but rather another five parameters, we can compare the observed, um, which is these uh, gray dots, with my model, which is this green line, with fits um, according to this other uh, five parameter model from Kaysen's 2017 Nature paper. Um, and you'll see that these models look really different, but they're actually fully um, or almost fully explained by this one parameter, uh, a couple others, but one by far makes a huge difference, and that's the lanthanide fraction. Uh, if you remember that periodic table, um, that lanthanide fraction is the second to last row, which is, if you know anything else about the lanthanides, uh, pretty radioactive. <laughs> so they decay over a long time span, which is why my light curve um, decays over a longer um, time frame. Um, so actually, this explanation. Uh, does a good job at explaining that the population of kill nova is not super simple. It, it's very dynamic um, based on the initial conditions. Uh, and this is to say that first part was very cool and all, um, but I also kind of lied to you. We didn't actually create the initial conditions exactly. There's a little bit of a problem. 
um, right around here, this ye at 0.34 about, you'll see that this gray line, which is the mass model that we've been using, I'll talk more about the mass model later, um, deviated a little bit um, and didn't well um, reproduce the abundances. But this uh, other model, this unit F0, did a better job. So we didn't know why, so we tried to understand these model complexities. Uh, the reason that we have these model complexities, first of all, is that when the kiln nova makes these super heavy elements, uh, it's not making normal isotopes of gold. Gold comes in one um, natural abundance um, at gold 197. Realistically, in the lab, we can make things like gold 200, gold 201. Uh, we're never making gold 220 in the lab ever. Um, and this stuff is the things um, that exist in our kiln nova. Um, so when things like gold 220 decay, um, we have a nuclear mass model. That nuclear mass model determines what the gold 220 would fission into, and it also determines how much energy is bound up in the nuclear interactions. Just like how in chemistry there's energy in bonds, we have energy in the nuclear interactions. Which then um, we try to reconcile with our light curve. So this FRDM model underperforms in a certain um, element range, which translates to a certain YE range, and basically sub in the better model within that range. Um, and you can see the comparison of all the slight curves over here. Um, there's some small differences, um, and you can see them if you zoom in enough, but for all intents and purposes, uh, these are all <laughs> the same light curve. So we find a negligible difference by varying the mass model, which ultimately means that we can't pick it apart too much, which leads to the conclusion here. What we can and cannot do um, by modeling the kiln level light curves. What we can do is we can recreate uh, and compare light curves based on stellar abundances. Uh, we cannot offer meaningful constraints, however, uh, for disagreements in the nuclear mass models. But not to dwell too much on what we can't do, what we can do is um, quite beneficial for the future. Uh, in the future, um, we can do more retroactive observations of Kilnova for more um, metal poor stars that are enriched by these um, Kilnova mergers and create more light curves to better make the population, to better inform future models like the ones that I use and the ones that Casey used. Um, and then finally, I'd like to end with some acknowledgments. I'd like to thank my mentor. I'd like to thank the Cassie program, Gwen, um, Surf, and the Crown Fellowship, and my family, and my co -engines. Thank you. I'll actually uh, go back. Hi, uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering about the toy model that you're using from uh, Metzger. Yeah. So what does this model assume about the uh, symmetry of the explosion? Is it spherical symmetry? Is there a cocoon there? Um, it does assume... Uh, 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 it does assume spherical symmetry, but... Um, one of the interesting things about Kilnova is that the speed of the ejecta matters a huge amount. So um, my model actually takes, um, and you can change this, um, but it has 200 different velocity shells. So they're all spherically symmetric, but they're shells that are going off at different speeds, which have different physics, um, different opacities, which then affect the heating rates in different ways, which then ultimately affects the light curve. So yes, spherically symmetric, but there is certainly some dynamic stuff going on there. Hey, so neat work, really cool. Um, I'm wondering about your kind of two uh, light curves. Uh, so it looks like your kind of proposed progenitor light curve for 222925 is a very different event from uh, 170817, right? It looks like it's happening a lot slower. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of comment on kind of the differences between these events, uh, you know, what's happening in the kind of progenitor systems, what what we know about them. Yeah, so um, the the one big parameter difference, again, was that lanthanide fraction being much larger, which um, does largely like make conceptual sense. Um, the, these light curves are powered by the decays, so if you're having things like the lanthanides, which decay over longer time frames, versus uh, in this case, you might have um, super heavy elements that want to decay immediately, um, again, on the time span of hours, 
you're gonna decay immediately and then drop down versus if you're gonna make a bunch of lanthanides that decay over um, weeks because they have half lives of like uh, days. So they're still decaying uh, over weeks. You're gonna have it drag out for a couple weeks instead. Cool, neat. Make it wrong. <laughs> Hi, Ian. This was a very fascinating talk. I had a question about um the other model that you mentioned that was using that was not using electron fraction at all and using um five other parameters. And I was wondering if uh, there's a reason why, what are the differences, and if there are other parameters you could consider in your model besides the electron fraction. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of other parameters uh, I, I vary. Uh, if we actually speed through here, one of the big ones I don't really talk about is oh, somewhere here. Um, ejected mass is a big one. Uh, it's also hard to know. It's hard to pin down. Um, it ended up being the same between our two models. Um, the other one, uh, we had a lot of the same other variables. Velocity is a big one. Um, so as I talked about before, so there's different velocity ranges for different kilonova. Um, the big different one that they use was they went largely off of the lanthanide fraction for their model. Um, and the reason that they didn't use YE is because going back in time like that is like that distribution is very complicated. So it's hard for people to say anything other than like a single value that they kind of just made up. Um, so they use other models uh, and other simulations. Great. Let's thank Ian again.